Hit it, Phil. Da, 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 da. Can it be the breeze that fills the trees with rare and magic perfume? Oh, no. <laughs> it isn't the breeze. It's Jackson time. La, da, da, da. Cord. Well, Joel, again, this is Buck Benny speaking. Today, we have uh, Terry Phillips with us from Imaginary Theater. Love it when Terry's back, so it's neat having him back for our show. We also have John Henderson here. Um, you know, it's okay having John here, I suppose. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> as he's competing with me over there on the... No, we're not really competing, but he's over Now cut this, that out. <laughs> this, <laughs> this day in Jack Benny, it's a wonderful, wonderful podcast to hear uh, John's insights into kind of... It's I, I love John's intros because they're they're about the show, but they really focus almost more on what's happening um, around uh, the world at the time of the show, and so he gives you some of the some of the commercials and things that were going on, or some of the news that's going on, and then also insights into things in the shows. So if you get a chance to check out John's website, it's wonderful. Thanks, um, and it's interesting because the more I do it, when I go back and listen to episodes I've already done the more I realize I've missed or like subtle things. I'll mention a couple in this episode as we get to it. Excellent. Excellent. Well, and that's the thing too, because as John's doing what I've been doing for many years, you start going back and revisiting an episode that you've done earlier and you, and you do think, oh, I can change that or add something to that. I mean, it's one of the reasons why we, we do where we're doing this about the radio shows, because um, I listen to my intros and they're getting you know, a little long in the tooth, they're like from five or 10 years ago. And uh, we just, I think, have more insights to share and more things. And, and I love getting other people's thoughts on it too. So anyway, to today's episode, you are just in for a, a real treat. I mean, I love, love, I, I can't tell you how, I, I wasn't, I was surprised with, with, I didn't remember how good this episode was, or these episodes anyway. So, um, the first one is from 1947. This is uh, an episode where Jack has Samuel Goldwyn um, visiting him and they're chatting. Um, and it's it's just a wonderful visit they have. And it's so light and airy and just they're, they're laughing and yet they keep the bit going and that's great. Um, it's very reminiscent about the 37s because we've been having some conversation over on the jack benny fan club about some folks saying that they prefer the the 37 38 39 time frame to the 47 48 49 time frame right because historically that's considered the golden era the the, the late 40s but the late 30s there's a a freewheeling feel a looser sort of and, and it's so much fun in its own way. There, Andy Devine's in there, and when Andy Devine's in there, they, they, they break up a lot more. And this has that feel to it. This 47 is one of the ones that feels the lightest, almost like a 37 episode. So it's kind of fun to be able to listen to both of them, and so you'll have a 47 and a 37 to listen and compare. Uh, we also have Phil Harris' show today, and Phil, uh, it's all about him dressing up in a, in a bunny outfit. And I really think he was in the actual bunny outfit for the performance because you can see when he's supposed to have the bunny outfit on, the audience just loses it, just completely loses it, and uh, is so charming of an episode. Um, yeah, the the whole evening is going to be great, and and we'll go more into that as we go. Um, the other thing I, I wanted to share. Uh, up front just to realize hopefully people are tuning in because you can watch us you can listen to us of course on the podcast but you can watch us on on youtube and the thing is i sync up the script to the 1947 episode so you'll follow along and be able to read the script as you go and reading that samuel goldwyn part with jack i think would be a lot of fun while they're going through it so anyway so i would suggest people tune into that and the last thing i'll share it is last week, last Sunday, um, I played, uh, we had an interview with um, Rochester's son uh, about Rochester's very first appearance on the Jack Benny show as the train porter. And on YouTube, I put it up there correctly and it was all good. On my own podcast, I grabbed the wrong episode. I, it was the right episode. It just didn't have uh, Eddie Anderson Jr. on there. It was just oh, me introducing no. it. And so I, I flipped it in the middle of the week. So if you're a podcast listener, at least go back and listen to that episode from last Sunday and 
you'll get to hear, I think it's well worthwhile to hear Eddie's thoughts on his dad. And, and it's just a wonderful little interview we do. Yeah. And then also, um, I'm going to link to, to, from today in the show notes, I'll link to both this week's show and that show on YouTube. So that's where I would catch it if I were you, but it's, it's up to you whether you want to listen to it or whatever. So I thought yeah. I'd just explain if, that's why. If it is downloaded on your phone, delete it and then yeah. download it again. Otherwise you'll just keep getting the same one. Same. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, it's always tricky when you do that. Anyway, but uh, but now let's get on with the show. And and I think I'll throw it over um, to Terry to start us out. Um, do you do you know much about uh, Samuel Goldwyn or or what he? I do was... know. I do know a bit about Samuel Goldwyn. Um, the, I think the first exposure I had to him was through what had come to be known as Goldwynisms. Mm -hmm. uh, Sam Goldwyn was born in Poland, so English was not his first language. And he would occasionally say things uh, that were unintentionally funny, like uh, this, um, this oral contract isn't worth the paper it's written on, which has become a cliche. It was a Goldwynism. Or, or he I heard said, it, but I didn't um, know it was from him. So. He said, coffee isn't my cup of tea, you know? <laughs> Where, where does this come from? And and I I come from a, a an immigrant family, and so I, I have some firsthand knowledge of how people can be unintentionally funny with uh, a, what is a foreign language to them. And I, I speak uh, a little bit of a few other languages, and, and I'm sure that I've made some boneheaded comments that other people find funny. Well, Goldwyn became famous for these, you know, weird turns of phrase. Um, but he also was one of the most powerful people in Hollywood in that era. And so uh, people had to be careful around him, not to, not to mock him, not to belittle him in front of him. All that said, he had a terrific sense of humor, as we will hear in this episode. I, I was amazed by how funny he was. I had forgotten that he lived um, into the, the 1970s. I think he died in. 73 or 70 maybe it was 74 right so he was yeah. around for a long time and and so people got to uh got to see interviews with him on i think he might have been on the tonight show uh or talk to jack parr i can't remember but he was around for a long long time and as i said was a very powerful force in hollywood but this is an example this episode that we're going to hear is is an example of how despite the fact that I love the theater of the mind, that there are times when I wish I could see what was going on in the radio studio and the episodes that we're listening to, because I'm sure that the audience, that the live studio audience at that time was enjoying aspects of this show that we can only imagine. Yes. Um, but it was, a, it was a wonderful, wonderful episode. Even if you don't know anything about Sam Goldwyn, it, all, of the, all of the laughs are mined and, and they, they come right through. Yeah, even if even, this would be a great episode to play for somebody that didn't even know Jack Benny, because it's just that good and that funny, and it just works um, yeah. so so very well. I, yep. I yep. love this episode. This I hadn't, you know, as you go back through, you start listing things. You know, this would have to be in my top ten somewhere of episodes. It's just so good. Um, John, what were your thoughts on it? Uh, yeah, I thought Sam Goldman was very funny, and it's. It's interesting when you get somebody like that who's not a performer mm -hmm. and they bring him on the show and it's sort of this strange mix of like being like really good, but also a little bit awkward. And it just adds to the, the dynamic of like reality, like there's something real going on here. So I mm -hmm. thought that was really fun. Uh, you know, in the background, um, I, which they mentioned in the episode, during the Academy Awards, Sam Goldwyn introduced Hoagie Carmichael, the singer-songwriter. Uh, he's mainly a songwriter. And uh, I, I think that you said that wrong. It's Hugo Carmichael, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. <laughs> and, and piano player, don't forget. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's right. He introduced him as Hugo Carmichael. And after that, <laughs> Jack Benny started, like, even he was hosting the awards. Even right after that, he started to, like, tease him for it. And then 
at his own show afterwards. He was, he's been sort of teasing him for it. So to actually bring him on and tease him about it there, I thought yeah. was really funny. And they really, they really milked that for all it's worth. Oh, for sure. And the added pieces, I mean, uh, I, we're not gonna, I'm not going to give anything away, but just uh, the part about Jack having hidden talents is so funny that the, the follow-up line that they, and, and a lot of it, I mean, he's, he's a funny guy who delivers his lines pretty well. I mean, I, I love having Sam Gold on here, but it, the writing level that they did for him is just amazing. And that's why everybody wanted to be on Jack's show. You knew he was going to make you funny and he was going to just do wonderful things for you. As long as you could deliver the lines or find the lines in there. Yeah. Uh, and but, like, like you're saying, Jack John, I think the, uh, another person very similar to this that that you get and you never know if he's going to be able to walk the tightrope between being able to deliver his lines or not is whenever Bidey Talcott shows up, the mayor of Waukegan. Yeah. Um, and he does a beautiful job so much of the time. I, I, I love when Bidey's on and he was on a couple weeks ago and, and we talked about him a little bit. But it, it's that same feeling when a non-professional or someone who's not used to to being on a weekly show comes on and tries to do it. But these guys are, I mean, obviously Samuel Goldwyn and Bidey Talcott both had to deliver speeches, had to, they, they're, they're used to being in public, just not quite in this way. And so I think that leads them to doing a pretty darn good job when they're on here and makes it extra fun. And when they get their lines right and it comes out right, you could just hear Jack is just giddy yeah. with, <laughs> with excitement of how well the bit's going and just how funny they are and things. So it's great. Yeah. John, John and, you were going to say. I was going to say that, uh, you know, the, the writing is always good on the Jack Benny show, but there are yeah. certain patterns that they go into. And so I always find, even when I see something coming, the delivery is so funny that I'll laugh anyway. This episode had a couple of great moments that really took me by surprise and made me laugh out loud, which I won't spoil, obviously, or it won't right. take you by surprise. But yeah, I, I thought this was such a funny episode. Um, and this is an interesting thing because uh, Mel Blank, I believe, is in this episode but he doesn't do anything funny. He doesn't do anything zany or silly. He plays it totally straight, which is very interesting and strange to hear. I thought the same thing. I was like, that's, I know that that's him. And it's like, but it's, it's like a part that's written more for like what Elliot Lewis would come in and do for the uh -huh. show. But of course, Elliot Lewis is not on the show this week. Or it's written like, a, a, who is it that, Kearns that comes in and sometimes Russell does Kearns. That's right. yeah some of the straight stuff yeah, yeah. it works I mean like the interviewer pieces or whatever and but that's how he does it and so and people have been saying and we've even been talking about um what is his normal voice because he seems to always be adopting other people's voices well I'd say this I would think would be the the most normal unless he was this was his fake serious voice I don't know <laughs> anyway you know what we're not what we're not directly pointing to that makes this episode so wonderful at least for me yeah. is that Samuel Goldwyn and Jack Benny laughed at each other's mistakes yeah. mm -hmm. and it reminded me of what I used to enjoy about the Carol Burnett show where they mm -hmm. would crack each other up right. um Red Skelton was famous for, for going up on lines. And Saturday Night Live it does that. Too. Of course, SNL does this. Yeah. And and I know it's supposed to be, quote, unprofessional, but I just love it when when they uh, when they crack each other up or crack Oh, so do up. I. And, and, the, and the trick is, and they sometimes, all the shows you're mentioning, and even not so much Jack's, but more of those other shows you're mentioning, sometimes I'll push it too far or or they just will lose control of themselves and 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 the bit starts to fall apart. Yeah. What what's lovely about this is it pushes it right to that edge of where it's actually adding entertainment value but not taking away from the bit. The bit's still working great yeah. because yeah. they're both laughing kind of at each other as they're going and at the bit as they're going but they stop and say their lines correctly and don't lose the the flow of the of the bit and that's hard to do. Um uh, certainly Saturday Night Live often loses the bit in the in, in the flow of things. Carol Burnett, usually they can pull it off, um, but not always. Sometimes they lose it. Um, uh, I still, uh, everybody cracking up when she, uh, when she has gone with the wind and comes out with the, uh, yeah. <laughs> with the, with the whole um, curtain rod 
because the dress was supposed to be made out of curtains in the in the movie supposedly and so they had it yeah the same thing here but they actually left the curtain rod in and so it's going across her shoulders and making her shoulders stick out like six feet on each side it, uh, it was that was amazing piece but that's the kind of thing that this is and it's just charming to get it so yeah I can agree. i can yeah, i mention ahead. a joke in this episode that fell a little bit flat sure and you wouldn't notice it if you didn't know what came next, which is Jack Benny says to Phil Harris, I need you like a moose needs a hat rack. Right. You wouldn't notice it. You let it go. Okay. It got a little laugh, nothing big, but we'll find out moving forward yeah. that he starts to refer to this joke as like the biggest flop eye in the series. Yes. basically. So. Well, and, and was this, so was this the first time as far as you know of them doing the joke? I know it was around this time frame, so it must've been. Yeah. And, well, and they're not making a joke of the joke. He's right. just playing it straight. It's so just a joke, the yeah. Way. And so you wouldn't yeah. think you bring back a bad joke. So, so yeah. I, I assume this is the actual airing of that joke, and then they play with it almost like the horn blows at midnight exactly, in some ways. Yeah. For, for John, I am so <laughs> glad you mentioned that because I was shocked by how flat that joke fell. Oh. It's not. It's not the greatest joke in the world, but the audience there was no reaction. It wasn't a slight <laughs> reaction. It was like. You know, well, it's like it went over everybody's heads. And yeah, like, it was. It was, yeah. I mean, it was just like you said. Hello. Too much. You know, there was no nothing. I don't well, know. It's a, it's a it's a visual thing you have to picture in your head. The maybe, moose, maybe. right? And then you're going like he needs a hat. Well, he's got a built-in hat, right? I mean, maybe, it's it was like, too, maybe you're right. Maybe it was too complicated. It's too complicated. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's too much to think of and then laugh immediately. It's one of those yeah. where if somebody told you it at a party or something, you'd kind of go and go away, and then you come back to them and go. I was thinking about that. That was really funny, you know, or whatever. And but of course, that doesn't <laughs> yeah, work yeah, in, totally. <laughs> in this situation. Yeah, yeah. The other piece, and I'm not sure if it's this episode or the next episode. So either way, you're either getting this a week earlier or whatever. But Dennis's thing about oh that he does, um, it's one of his better ones, and and I can't I, I can't even spoil it because I don't even remember it off the top of my head. I just remember <laughs> when I when he said it, it made me laugh, and I haven't laughed at one of his. Oh, some things in, in a little while. So, yes. uh, I, I think it is I, this episode. Is it this episode? I think so too. I think I think I was listening to this one, and it was it was kind of a good one. He had a good little zinger there. Yeah. Oh yeah, it it was no, it was next week's. Okay, it was next oh, week's we'll it was about we'll baseball. Again. So next week you'll hear Dennis about baseball, and it's a funny bit. So all right. Anyway, before before yeah, we wrap up, can I real quick mention Phil Harris? Because uh, I, I haven't heard that many of the Phil Harris show episodes, so I don't yeah. know how regular this character is. But that squeaky voice guy from Green Acres, and yes, he's yes. also in Robin Hood. Well, Pat, I've been wanting to mention Pat him but, too. Yes, Pat, Pat Buttram. Yeah, that's right. That's yes. right. Uh -huh. I, I just thought it was interesting that he was a regular. I hadn't heard him outside of like you know Disney and and Green Acres, and I thought it's interesting because he co-stars with Phil Harris in Robin Hood, the cartoon. Right. Uh, the Disney cartoon, right? Yeah. And then um, in this episode, Phil sings Necessity, not to be confused with the Bear Necessities. Yes. And he sings it with the Sportsman Quartet, which I thought was interesting because it's not on Jack's show. I didn't realize that they went back and forth at all. Mm -hmm. The Sportsmen were regularly on Phil's show. I don't know about the whole run or whatever, but they were, they were on there. They would usually sing... Uh, the backgrounds and stuff with um, Alice Faye on Alice ah. Faye's songs. But I think they did sing on both their songs at different times. So, but they would, but it wasn't all out in front. It was like more as a, a background singer thing, which is interesting that they didn't play that up more or talk about them more on the show. But anyway, I guess it's because whenever they were singing a song, it was supposed to be like, Oh, girls! I'm just going to practice this song. It would. It, it was never like supposed to be a whole production thing yeah. that it was, uh, just like Dennis's songs. And so they really couldn't say. And I've got look. The sportsman showed up. You know, yeah, which could but be like funny in this episode, where Hoagie Carmichael's like, "Let's imagine the orchestra." <laughs> yes. and then they go into the whole thing. <laughs> I love that bit too. Anyway, so uh, enjoy. You're in for a, a real treat here. And uh, on on YouTube, follow along with the script. It's it's a lot of fun. This is a great one to follow along with the script with. And uh, if you're not going to listen to it that way, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, the way it's designed was as an audio treat. And so get that. So here we go. 
and we'll see you guys next time. Thanks, gentlemen. The Jack Benny Program, presented by Lucky Strike. At 50 59, American. L-S-M-F-T. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. Here's what independent tobacco experts say about the fine tobacco bought by the makers of Lucky Strike. Mild tobacco with real flavor and mellowness. Tobacco you can't beat for top smoking enjoyment. Floyd Clay, top flight tobacco warehouseman, said that. Fine, ripe smoking leaf that makes a smooth, mild smoke. I've smoked Lucky's myself for 22 years. Lucian Purdom, ace tobacco auctioneer, said that. Yes, friends, at auction after auction, independent tobacco experts can see the makers of Lucky Strike by that fine, that light, that naturally mild tobacco. So for your own real deep down smoking enjoyment, remember... L-S-M-F-T. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. Real Lucky Strike tobacco. So smoke that smoke of fine tobacco, Lucky Strike. So round, so firm, so fully packed, so free and easy on the draw. The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let's go back to this morning and look in on Jack Benny at his home in Beverly Hills. Let's see. Maybe behind this chiffonier. I'll move it and look. <clears throat> no, not here. Maybe behind the sofa. Gee, not here either. Oh, Rochester. Yes, boss. Are you sure you hid the Easter eggs in this room? <laughs> huh? Keep looking. You're getting warm. Warm, huh? Oh, I know where you hit them. I'll bet you put the eggs in my violin case. Your violin case? Yeah. I wouldn't touch that thing if I was full of penicillin. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's see. Oh, I know where they are. Rochester, hold this chair steady for me while I stand on it. Okay. Steady now. Yep. Yeah, here they are. Four eggs. Doggone, I never thought you'd find the ones I hid in the chandelier. Rochester, I saw the lost weekend, too. <laughs> yeah, but Miss Milan got a better payoff than you did. I guess so. You know, Rochester, it was awfully nice of you to color and hide these eggs so I could have fun on Easter Sunday. What made you do it? Well, last year I didn't, and when you got up in the morning, you cried your little blue eyes out. <laughs> I did not. I never cried. Nothing could upset me that much. <laughs> what are you laughing at? When Shirley Temple got married, you locked yourself in the room for three days. <laughs> Rochester. And when you finally came out, you tore up all your pictures of Margaret O'Brien. <laughs> oh, stop making up stories. Imagine me and Margaret O'Brien. She's young enough to be my daughter. So was Theda Barrow, but that didn't slow you down. <laughs> I've told you dozens of times that Theda and I were just good friends. Now, Rochester, I want you to take these four eggs and put them away for me. But, boss, I hid five of them all together. Five? Well, let's see. Maybe the other one is hidden behind the... I'll get it, Rochester. Maybe they're delivering my new car. Hello, Jack. Why, Mary, happy Easter. Come on in. Say, that's a good-looking Easter outfit you have on. And that hat. Do you really like the hat, Jack? Like it? Why, it looks beautiful on you. If you think it looks good on me, you should have seen it on Tom Brenneman. <laughs> Tom Brenneman? Oh, did you go to his program, Breakfast in Hollywood? Sure, I go all the time. I was even there the morning you won the orchid. <laughs> oh, yes. Gee, I'll never forget the look on the loser's face. Poor thing, she came all the way from Iowa. <laughs> But, Mary, all dressed up in your Easter outfit, where have you been? Well, Jack, you know, on Easter Sunday, most of the movie stars walk down Wilshire Boulevard, and I went along to see the parade. Oh. You see any celebrities? Oh, sure. I saw lots of them. I saw Bing Crosby. Crosby, eh? Was Bing dressed up for Easter? Was he? I've never seen him so formal. He was wearing patent leather shoes, gray spats, striped pants, and a cutaway pajama top. <laughs> Who else did you see on the boulevard, Mary? Well, I saw Gary Cooper and his wife. Uh -huh. Mrs. Cooper was wearing a beautiful green dress with fox trim and gold accessories. She looked lovely. And hey, what was Gary wearing? Brown shoes, tan slacks, and a light jacket. Oh, did he have a hat on? I couldn't tell. It was cloudy. 
And I saw Shirley Temple. I knew I'm not interested in her. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Jack. I thought you'd forgiven her already. Now, let me think. Oh, yes, I saw Van Johnson. Van Johnson? Yes, and you know, Jack, I feel very sorry for the poor guy. Every step he took, he was followed by dozens of girls. They just kept trailing after him for miles. For miles? My goodness, you'd think those silly kids would get tired. Yeah. Jack, may I have a chair? My feet are killing me. <laughs> Here, Mary, you can sit in this armchair. Thanks. Ah, gee, it's good to sit in it. Hey, boss, Miss Livingston just found the other egg. <laughs> Well, hurry, Rochester. Get her a towel and... <laughs> Never mind the towel. Just bring a handful of corn. <laughs> you know, Mary, every Easter, there's another... I'll get it, Rochester. That must be my new car. Phil! Hiya, Jackson. Hello. Living long time no see. <laughs> Hello, Curly. Come on in. Say, Phil... Phil, we missed you in San Francisco. I know. Uh, I heard the program. <laughs> <laughs> what? You need me, Jackson. You need me. <laughs> Phil. Like scotch needs soda, your program just don't fizz without the kid, Jackson. <laughs> Phil, I need you like a moose needs a hat rack. <laughs> Believe me. Anyway, you should have been up there with us, Phil. We had a wonderful time. San Francisco is such a swell town. You don't have to tell me about Frisco, Livy. I organized my first band there. You... You what, Phil? I started my first band up there. Mm, San Francisco sure gone through a lot. <laughs> Your band and the earthquake. <laughs> they can take it, can't they? Gee whiz, I'll never forget my first band, Jackson. It was just a little three-piece outfit, a saxophone, piano, and drums. And then we added Frankie, my guitar player. Say, Phil, how'd you happen to hire Frankie? Well, we didn't exactly hire him. You see, we was playing at a wedding and they couldn't afford to pay us, so they gave us the groom. <laughs> <laughs> the groom? What happened to the bride? Oh, she changed her name, started singing with some other band. I don't know what... Really? What's her name now? Carmen Lombardo. <laughs> Phil, for your information, Carmen Lombardo is a man. Well, maybe it was Carmen Miranda. I don't remember girls' names. I don't fool with dames no more. What do I know about it? <laughs> Can I get it, boss? No, I better answer the door. I'm expecting my new car. Hey, wait a minute, Jackson. I can't believe it. Did you buy a new car? No, he entered Bob Hope's jingle contest. <laughs> yeah. Jack, you didn't send in that jingle you wrote. Certainly, and I think it ought to win. What was the jingle he wrote, Livy? My favorite brunette, and I love him still. Is Honest Abe on a $5 bill. <laughs> well, I thought that was pretty good. Go ahead and answer it, Rochester. Okay. Boss, boss, it is your new car. It's a beautiful, light, gray color. Uh-oh, my mistake is Mr. Wilson in a new suit. <laughs> oh, well, steer him. I show him in, Rochester. Hello, Jack, Mary, Phil. Hello. Great kid. Gosh, Don, you sure look handsome in your Easter outfit. Yeah, Dante, where'd you buy that nifty-looking suit? Oh, same place I get all my clothes, at Hart Schaffner, Marks, and O'Reilly. <laughs> all right, don't you mean just Hart Schaffner and Marks? <laughs> oh, when I buy a suit, they call in extra help. <laughs> that I can understand. The fellow who makes your pants was an engineer on Boulder Dam. <laughs> but, Don, we were just talking about being up in San Francisco. Did you have a good time up there? Oh, did I? You know, Jack, I love that town. They have the most wonderful restaurants and the best food in the world. They certainly have. I ate at John's Rendezvous, then I ate at the Tonga Room, then I ate at the Popagaya Room in the Fairmont, then I ate at Roberts and the Nugget, and then I ate at Omar Khayyam. Gee. And then on the second day, I ate at... What? <laughs> <laughs> the next day, I was eating at the Mark Hopkins, and right in the middle of dinner, they ran out of food. The Mark Hopkins? No, San Francisco. Oh. <laughs> Speaking of food has made me hungry. Hey, let's go out in the kitchen, kids, and get some sandwich. What? Oh, you yeah, see yeah, it? for oh. sure.
Rochester, those sandwiches were very good. They certainly were. Thanks. Mr. Wilson, would you like another bucket of coffee? <laughs> He's had enough. Now, look, kid. Isn't anybody going to say hello to me? Oh, Dennis. Dad, when did you come in? Oh, I've been here all the time. I was standing behind Mr. Wilson's right leg. <laughs> oh. Well, say, kid, I, I tried to reach you on the phone last night, but nobody answered. Where were you? Oh, my mother took me to the circus. Well, well, did you enjoy it? Yeah, and you should see those girls on the flying trapeze. They wore tights. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis, they always wear tights. Say, those trapeze acts are dangerous. Did any of them fall? No, I guess they were all buttoned up. <laughs> she didn't mean that. Oh. Hey, how is the circus this year, kid? Oh, it's swell. In one act, they shot a man out of the cannon and he landed right in my mother's lap. My God, what did your mother do? She hung on to him and yelled, I have a man in the balcony, doctor. <laughs> oh, boy. Dennis, wasn't your father there? He was the one who aimed the cannon at my mother. <laughs> Stop. Aim the cannon at his mother. <laughs> anything. They say anything. <laughs> Dennis, how'd you like the clowns? Oh, they were all right, I guess. What do you mean, you guess? The clowns are big stars. They're very funny. But how come they've only got one show? <laughs> Dennis, just because you and Phil have two shows doesn't mean that everybody has to have them. Let me know. tell you something, Jackson. Hold it a minute. Not only have I got two shows, but while you were in San Francisco, I signed up to make a new picture. A new picture, Phil. What's the name of it? The Keg and I. <laughs> oh, Harris, you may not be Frederick March, but you're the best years of anybody's life. <laughs> now I've heard everything. Phil, Phil, let me tell you something. You were only... <laughs> Phil, you were only kidding about making a picture. I'd like to get a new cast sometime. <laughs> but it may, it may surprise you to know that right now there's a deal pending where I'm going to be starred in a picture for Samuel Goldwyn. Samuel Goldwyn? Yes. He makes great pictures, and he's the kind of a producer I want to be with. I'll bet Mr. Goldwyn has to work very hard to support his family. He's got 30 daughters. What? The Goldwyn girls. <laughs> <laughs> They're not his daughters, then. But anyway, Don, if this deal we're making comes through, it'll really be sensational. You know, Mr. Goldwyn is begging me to consider his offer. Begging you? <laughs> what are you laughing at? Well, tell him what happened yesterday when you were out to his studio. Mary. Hey, what was it, Livy? Mary, if you open your mouth, I'll never tell you another <laughs> thing again. <laughs> Come on, Mary, tell us what happened when Jack went out to see Mr. Goldwyn. Well, about 2 oh. o'clock yesterday afternoon, Rochester drove Jack out to the studio. <laughs> There's the main gate, Rochester. I'll get off here. Uh, Rochester, you wait right here in the car for me. Boss, do you mind if I lean against that new Cadillac over there? It's good for my morale. <laughs> no, no, as long as you wait here. Gee, what a high-class studio. Hmm. Look at the way they got Frederick Marches picture plastered all over. I beg your pardon, sir. Huh? You can't go through this gate without a pass. A pass? Well, perhaps you don't recognize me. If you knew who you were talking to, you'd let me go right in. Oh, no, I wouldn't, Mr. Benny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, maybe I have a pass in my wallet. I'll take a look. Well? Wait till I open it. <laughs> <laughs> there First time this year, Mr. Benny? <laughs> no, no, no Now let's see Here's the pass for Warner Brothers Here's one for Universal International Here's one for Biograph <laughs> <laughs> Oh, here's something I don't need anymore. See, my draft card. You know, you can tear them up now, you know. You could have torn that one up in 1918. <laughs> you don't have to be so... Oh, wait a minute, here it is. Gate pass to Samuel Goldwyn Studios. 
Now, Mr. Goldwyn's office is right through that door. You go right down the hall and turn to the left. Thank you. Da da dee da dum da dee da dum da dum da dee da da dum. Oh, hello. Hello, Mr. Benny. Da dum dum dee da dee dee bum bum bum. Hello. Hello, Mr. Benny. Dum dee da dee da dum da dee. Oh, hello. Hello, Mr. Benny. See those Goldwyn girls are beautiful. <laughs> Let's see. Gee, won't Mr. Goldwyn be surprised to see me? I hope he's... Oh, this must be his office here. I, I beg your pardon, miss, but is, is this Mr. Goldwyn's office? Yes, sir. Well, will you tell him that Mr. Benny is here to see him? One moment, please. Mr. Goldwyn, uh, Mr. Benny is here to see you. I'll find out. What is it you wish to see Mr. Goldwyn about? Uh, a picture. He wishes to see you about a picture. Yes, sir. He told me to give you one out of the top drawer. <laughs> no, 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 no. You, you misunderstood. You see, I want to talk about... I want to talk to him about making a picture. You see, a movie. Oh, oh just a moment. Yeah. Mr. Goldwyn, Mr. Benny wants to talk to you about making a picture. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Goldwyn is busy right now. Would you care to wait? Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Goldwyn. Well, Hoagie. Hoagie Carmichael. Hello, Jack. <laughs> Gosh, Hoagie, here, here I am waiting to go into the office and you came out. Uh, I didn't know you were in there. I've been in that Goldwyn's office since 10 o'clock this morning. Since 10 o'clock this morning, eh? What were you doing in there all the time? I was just trying to convince him that my name is Hoagie and not Hugo. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. It happened at the Academy Award ceremonies when Mr. Goldwyn accidentally called you Hugo instead of Hoagie, but it was just a slight mistake. A slight mistake? Jack, for 25 years, I built up the name of Hoagie. Hoagie Carmichael. And it wasn't easy. I remember when I first started writing songs, I used to sit up nights, no food, hardly enough money to pay the rent. I was ready to quit, but my wife encouraged me. She said, Hoagie, you can do it. My mother encouraged me. She said, Hoagie, don't give up. My friends encouraged me, Hoagie, stick to it. And they were right. I can remember those great songs. Stardust by Hoagie Carmichael. Lazy Bones by Hoagie Carmichael. Old Buttermilk Sky by Hoagie Carmichael. They were all great, Hoagie. And who gets all the credit? Some no-talent jerk named Hugo. <laughs> well, Hoagie, Hoagie, maybe I can help you. Oh, I wish you would, Jack. All I am now is an unknown character with a million dollars. Whoops. <laughs> Did you say something, Jack? No, no, it's just that when I hear figures like that, something <laughs> happens, something happens in my stomach, you know? Oh, you mean just because I said a million dollars, you? <laughs> I, I did it again. But getting back to you, Hoagie, don't worry. Hoagie, I'll clear up your name for you. I've got a big listening audience, and if you want to come on my program and do one of your songs, I'll let everybody know it was written by Hoagie Carmichael, not Hugo. Uh, gosh, if you do that, I'd be very grateful, Jack. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll sing Old Buttermilk Sky with a special arrangement that will include your quartet, The Sportsman. My quartet? No, I don't think that that would what be... Do? <laughs> now, just a minute. Uh, I've got a copy of it right here. Let me show you what I mean. Uh, try to visualize it, Jack. What? Well, here's the way it would go. The introduction starts with full orchestra. <laughs> Old Buttermilk Sky I'm a keeping my eye peeled on you. Well, what's a good word tonight? Are you gonna be mellow tonight? Tonight, LSMFT. Let's a cigarette for Donzie and we. We're as happy as a Christmas tree. Heading for the one we love. I'm gonna pop her the question. That question. 
Wouldn't you like a lucky strike? Yes, it'll be easy, so easy. Well, that's the one that she will like. L-S-M-F-T. L-S-M-F-T. They won't fail you when you're needing them most. Oh, no. Hang a package on, on her hitch and pole. Lucky's for the one you love, the one you love. So round and so firm. So round and so firm. That's part of their churn. That's part of their churn. <laughs> will they be naturally mild tonight? Yes, sir. Why, sure, you bet that's Lucky Strike. What do you think, Jack? Uh, could you visualize what I'm telling you? Could I, Hoagie? I could even hear the applause. Wow. That's a wonderful song. Hoagie, would you mind autographing that copy for me? Oh, not at all. Thanks. So long, Jack. So long. Gee, that was nice of Hoagie to... Well, what do you know? He signed it, Hugo Carmichael. <laughs> He really is confused, you know. Mr. Goldwyn is waiting. Oh, yes, 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 thank you. Mr. Goldwyn? Thank you. Mr. Goldwyn? Hmm? Come right in. Oh. <laughs> Mr. Goldwyn, uh, Mr. Goldwyn, I hope you don't mind my breaking in without, without an appointment. No, no. It's always nice to see you. Sit down, Bob. <laughs> no, no, no. See, my name is Jack, Jack Benny. Oh, yes. Well, Jack, what can I do for you? Mr. Gowen, I've come here to give you the greatest opportunity of your life. Opportunity? <laughs> yes. When I tell you what I've got in my mind, it'll make you the greatest producer in the motion picture industry. This is an opportunity that comes only once... Pardon me. Hello. Hello, Fame of Home magazine. Yes, I produced the best years of our lives. Yes, that picture won nine awards for the best picture, for direction, for editing, for musical score, for story, for best actor, for best supporting actor, a special award for Harold Russell, and also the Tolbert Award. That's right. Thank you very much. Now, Jack. What was this opportunity you were going to give me? <laughs> well, let me, let's put it this way. Mr. Gowen, your studio won many Academy Awards this year, and I thought maybe you'd like to win them again next year. I certainly would. What is your suggestion? Well, have you ever thought of making a picture starring Jack Benny? <laughs> No. Let me help you up, Mr. Goldwyn. <laughs> no, let me rest here a while. <laughs> oh, oh. What we... <laughs> now, what were you saying, Jack? Well, what I was getting at... Pardon me, Mr. Goldwyn. Excuse me, Jack. What is it, Pat? Oh, Mr. Goldwyn, two blueprints have been submitted for the set on Stage 8, the reproduction of the George Washington Bridge overlooking New York Harbor. Yes. Now, on both sets, the harbor is always in evidence. However, set number one with just the harbor can be constructed for only a million dollars. Whoops! <laughs> <laughs> Did you... <laughs> Did you say something, Jack? No, 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 no. No, not a thing. On the other hand, in set number two, we can build the harbor, the bridge, and the skyline for an extra million. Whoop. <laughs> so you see, it's entirely up to you, Mr. Goldwyn, whether you want to spend one million... Whoops. ...or two million. Whoops, whoops. <laughs> What's the matter with you, Jack? Huh? You sound like a tugboat. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? Pat, I'll take number two. Uh, yes, Mr. Goldwyn. Now... What were, you, what were you talking about? Mr. Jack? Gowen, I'm not going to beat around the bush. If you make a picture with me, I'm sure we'll win the Academy Award next year. I've got hidden talents. <laughs> 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 
That's Snoogie. <laughs> no, really, I've got hidden talent. Maybe so. I haven't the time to play hide and seek. <laughs> But, Mr. Goldwyn... Now, nah, look, Jack, I'm a busy man. I know you are, Mr. Goldwyn, but it, it isn't as though I'm pleading for a job. I made lots of pictures. Call up Warner Brothers. They'll be very happy to recommend me to you. They'll be happy to recommend me to anybody. <laughs> I mean, look, look, Mr. Goldwyn, if you'd only think it over, I promise Pardon you... Pardon me, Mr. Goldwyn. What is it now, Pat? Well, we got to do something about the picture we're shooting on stage five. The script we have now is a little dated. The hero was a bombardier on a B-29. You're right. We should change it to something post-war, something civilian. Well, why don't you make him a tail gunner on a Studebaker? Uh, let me help you out, Pat. <laughs> He's a comedian. We'll talk about it later. Hmm. Tail gunner on a Studebaker. Well, I, I thought it was very funny, didn't you? Maybe so, Jack. In fact, I think you're very good on the radio. Radio, radio. I want pictures. Mr. Goldwyn, you got to help me. I want to win an Academy Award. Jack, let's talk about it some other time. What? I'm very... I'm way behind my appointments. I spent the whole morning talking to Hoagie. Hoagie? Yes, Hoagie Michelson. <laughs> Goldwyn, that's Hoagie Carmichael. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, now getting back to me, Mr. Goldwyn, why can't you produce a picture that'll make me win the Academy Award? Why? Tell me why. Well, Jack, maybe I can. Let me see how I look without those thick glasses that you're around. Take them off. All right. There. Now, see how I look with my glasses off? See how blue my eyes are? You know, that'll help if we make it in Technicolor. And look how, look how long my lashes are. Real, too. As a matter of fact, Mr. Goldwyn... You can put your glasses back on. Mr. Goldwyn went out to lunch. <laughs> but how could he leave? I was standing against the door. He jumped out the window. <laughs> out the window? Let me see. He didn't get away, boss. I caught him. Well, hold him. I'll be right down. <laughs> We'll be back in just a minute, but first, here is Basil Risedale. As you listen to the chant of the tobacco auctioneer, remember, LSMFT. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco, and fine tobacco is what counts in a cigarette. So listen to the words of a man who really knows fine tobacco, Mr. William Curran of Durham, North Carolina, for 24 years a tobacco auctioneer. He said... At more than a thousand auctions, I've seen the makers of Lucky Strike buy fine tobacco that's sweet and mild, chock full of smoke and enjoyment. I've smoked Lucky's myself for 23 years. Quote, fine tobacco that's sweet and mild, chock full of smoking enjoyment. Unquote. Yes, independent experts like Mr. Curran can see the makers of Lucky Strike consistently select and buy that fine, that light, that naturally mild tobacco. Fine, light, naturally mild tobacco. So remember, LSMFT, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. Year in, year out, LSMFT, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. And this fine Lucky Strike tobacco means real deep down smoking enjoyment for you. So smoke that smoke of fine tobacco, Lucky Strike. So round, so firm, so fully packed, so free and easy on the draw. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank Mr. Samuel Goldwyn for appearing on my program. His next release will be The Secret Life of Walter Mitty with my friend Danny Kay. I also want to thank Hoagie Carmichael, who appears with the courtesy of the makers of the Fifth Avenue Candy Bar. And ladies and gentlemen, be sure to listen in next Sunday as we haven't the slightest idea what we're going to do. <laughs> Good night, folks. <laughs> NBC, the national broadcasting company.
the F.W. Fitch Company presents the Fitch Bandwagon, starring Alice Faye. You never know just how much I love you. You'll never know just how much I care. And Phil Harris. Won't you come with me to Alabama? Let's go see my dear old mammy. She's frying eggs and frawling hammy, and that's what I like about the style. As in every household where there are children, Easter week at the Harrises is a time of great activity. One evidence of this activity was the arrival Friday morning of a package. Not long after opening it, Alice called her mother. Hello. Hello, Mom. Oh, it's you, Alice. How are your plans for the children's Easter party coming? Oh, fine. And that package just came. Did the tailor do a good job? Oh, yes, it's awfully cute. It's all made of pink velvet and has great big floppy ears and a big powder puff for a tail. <laughs> well, that's fine, Alice. But I still don't think you're going to get Phil to wear an Easter bunny suit. <laughs> have you told him yet? No. But don't worry. I have ways of making him do things. I know, dear, but do be careful. The last time you dislocated the poor boy's shoulder. <laughs> oh, I'll find a way to break it to him gently. You're coming to the party Sunday, aren't you? Oh, yes. Bill and I will be there about 2.30. That's fine. Oh, by the way, Alice. Yes? Well, this year when we get there, I wish you'd ask Phil not to make those remarks about your brother's head. <laughs> Don't worry, Mother. He'll be too busy hopping around in his bunny suit. <laughs> See you Sunday, dear. Goodbye, Mother. Hiya, beautiful. Who are you talking to? My mother. Well, I didn't say anything. <laughs> well, you better not. Phil, I want to talk to you about the children's party. Well, lay it on me, kid. I'm all ears. <laughs> well, you will be Sunday. <laughs> huh? By the way, I got you a new Easter suit to wear. You bought me a suit? Mm -hmm. Oh, you dear sweet thing. Come here to me and let me give you a big bear hug. <laughs> Well, you get the suit on. You can give me a bunny hug. Huh? Uh, well, what's it like? Well, in the first place, it's all pink. But, honey, I got two pink suits already. <laughs> I know, but this one is quite a bit different. You see, on the... Oh, there's the back door. I'll see who it is. You go see it is. I'm going up and shave. Okay. Oh, hello. Just put him down there. All right, Miss Faye. Julia, what are you staring at? You, Miss Faye. You have the rare beauty of a true thoroughbred. And your eyes are warm and friendly. <laughs> oh, why, Julia, the Bruzio. Where did you get such a, such a pretty feet? I read it in Mama Duke's The Story of a Brave Dog. <laughs> A present, Julia? Yeah, it's a poem. Oh, I'd love to hear it. Okay. <clears throat> Desire at Ralph's Market by Julius Abruzio. <laughs> it's true I'm just a grocery clerk, a poor, frustrated, lovelorn Jake. But all the dreary long day through, my thoughts go out, Miss Faye, to you. <laughs> Your voice, it speaks so soft and young, from every can of pickled tongue. <laughs> I see your face in cans of Crisco as salted fish from San Francisco. <laughs> but when cruel doubt within me stirs and hurried thoughts to me occurs, to my poor heart I say, be still. This dame will pay a grocery bill. <laughs> oh, Julia. That's very sweet. Yeah, ain't it? Well, I gotta get back to the market now. Farewell, soulmate. Goodbye, Julia. <laughs> Come 
over here, Phyllis. What are we doing in Mommy's closet, Alice? I want to show you something, but I don't see it. Mommy has so many dresses in here. Look at that one with the lace and ruffles. Is that a new one? No, I've seen that one lots of times. That's the one Daddy always puts on at parties. <laughs> looking for? Here it is. Oh, look, it's a pink bunny suit. That's right. Mommy's going to make Daddy put it on for our Easter party. You mean he's going to wear that thing in front of our little friends? Uh-huh. Oh, dear. Now we'll have to move again. <laughs> hey, hey, what are you kids doing in here? We know something you don't know. We know something you don't know. All right, we all right. Now cut that out. You sound like the Andrews sisters. <laughs> <laughs> all right, what's it all about? What's it all about? Alice, you tell me. Well... You better sit down for this one, Daddy. I will not. Now, what is it? Well, you know our party tomorrow. Yes. And you see this pink suit in Mommy's closet? Yes. Well, you're going to be the Easter Bunny, and they ate all over the lawn. <laughs> Who said that? Mommy. Oh, she did, huh? Well, listen, we'll see about that. Alice. Alice. Alice! What is it, Phil? Ooh! <laughs> you scared me. I thought you were Peter Lorre. <laughs> What's all this shouting for? I'll tell you what it's for. What's this about me wearing a bunny suit? That's right, bunny boy. No, oh, no, you don't. Listen, if you want somebody to be a bunny, call your brother. He looks like a rabbit anyway. <laughs> he does not. Then why does your mother always pick him up by the ears? <laughs> now look, Phil Harris. The children have counted on this, and if you think for one all minute right, that you're going right. to get Hold out of it... Hold it a I... minute. There's the door. Hold it a minute. Yeah? Uh, so excuse me, Mr. Harris. Uh, I'm uh, Chicken Snyder. Oh, yeah, Chicken. You're the newspaper reporter. Yeah, that's right. I'm um, from the Canoga Park, North Hollywood, Encino, and Van Nuys Gazette. <laughs> yeah, well, come on in, Chicken. How you been? Oh, just fine. You're looking good, but you got a nick on your face. Howdy do, Miss Faye. Cut yourself shaving? Yes, for razor. <laughs> do for you, Mr. Snyder? Well, ma'am, uh, I'm sure sorry I mistook your husband last week for Zeke Harris, the hay feeding fertilizer man. <laughs> oh, no, that's all right, chicken. We all make mistakes. Well, well what I come up for, I heard you folks are giving a party this Sunday. I thought I might write it up for my society column. Well, gee whiz, that's awful nice of you, but it's not going to be a big event. Alice and I are going to have 12 children on Sunday. And you don't call that a big event? <laughs> Look, chicken, look, uh, you don't understand. I mean, yes. Now, there'll just be 12 kids and then about six adults. And one bunny. A bunny? Who, who's going to be the bunny? The carrot, the fertilizer king. All right, yes. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, folks. I'll give you Easter party a nice little write-up. Gee, that'll be awful nice of you if you will, chicken. Yes, sir. I can just see the headline now. Phil Harris lays another egg. <laughs> Backed up by the sportsman, Phil Harris brings us a new tune from the hit show, Finian's Rainbow, a number he recently recorded for Victor. What is the curse that makes the universe so all bewildering? What is the hoax that just provokes the folks they call God's children? What is the jinx that give the body and his brother and everyone around the runaround? Everyone the runaround. Everyone the runaround. Necessity. Necessity. 
necessity. Necessity. That most unnecessary thing. Necessity. How unnecessary. What throws the monkey wrench in? A fella's good intention. That nasty old invention. Necessity. Brother, you so right. My free one attention to sun. My head wants a rest in the shade. The Lord says go out and have fun, but the landlord says. Man, you rent ain't paid. Necessity. Necessity. It's plain to see. It's plain to see. What a lovely old world this silly old world could be. World could be. But man, it's all in a mess. The count of necessity. Necessity. Hallelujah. I hear you talking. Necessity. Yes, sir. Now you let me tell you. There ought to be a law against necessity. Now the jail would never been there, except for folks who sin there. Well, uh, well, well, how did you get in there? Necessity. Oh, life not to dream for a loop. Love knocks you flat on your pan. And sin lands you right in the soup. But nothing socks you harder than necessity. You mean he's a... That's right, brother. Necessity. There's nothing lower than less. Unless it's necessity. Necessity. How low can you get? Say, look at that girl. Did you ever see such gorgeous hair? Gee, she's great. No wonder we men are attracted by women who use Fitch's dandruff remover shampoo. For Fitch is a real beauty product that leaves your hair touchably soft, romantically smooth, sparkling with glamorous highlights. Fitch reveals the natural loveliness of your hair in two ways. First, it thoroughly cleanses the hair and scalp with its special antiseptic cleansing action. Second, it reconditions dry, oily, brittle, or problem hair by helping restore its elasticity. Yes, ladies, first Fitch cleanses, then it reconditions. It leaves your hair ready to take and keep a wave longer and responsive to the comb. Fitch is effective in either hard or soft water for all colors and textures of hair. And since it is completely soluble, no special after rinse is needed. So make up your mind to have attractive hair that invites romance. Use Fitch's dandruff remover shampoo regularly. Your hair will be soft, shining with bewitching highlights, irresistible to all. On Saturday, faced with the awful prospect of wearing a bunny suit Easter morning, Phil turned for consolation to that pillar of solidity and strength, Frankie, his guitar player. (laughs) Gee whiz, I hope Frankie's home. I got to talk to somebody. Bunny suits. Got to lay eggs on the lawn yet. Oh, this is murder. Oh, here's his door. Who is it? It's me, Frankie. Phil, Phil, let me in. Oh, just a minute, Curly. I got something against the door. I'll move it. (laughs) Okay, come on in, Phil. (laughs) Frankie, what's the idea of piling all that junk in front of your door? Necessity. I'm three months behind on my rent. (laughs) 
Look, Frankie, I'll lend you the money. How much is three months' rent? Six bucks. <laughs> How can you get an apartment for two dollars a month? I share the room. With another guy? No, with a hockey team. <laughs> Hey, what are you doing around here today? Oh, I had a little trouble at home again. Tomorrow's Easter, and Alice wants me to wear a pink rabbit suit with big floppy ears and a great big fluffy tail. Well, you great big cuddly bunny boo. Cut it out. <laughs> this is serious. Well, remember what I told you when you married her, Curly? The day would come when the kissing would stop and the hitting on the head would begin. <laughs> That's right, and you're no help. You can see I'm in an awful spot. Well, why don't you do like Robert Mitchum in that picture? Some dame started pushing him around, and he jumped out a 50-story window. Yeah, but didn't it kill him? No, I seen him in another picture last night. He didn't have a scratch. <laughs> well, them movie stars know how to fall. <laughs> yeah. Now, listen, Curly, the way I look at it, it's time for action. This thing with you and Alice is the French Revolution all over again. French Revolution? Yeah. The time has come for you married peasants to rise against tyranny. Yeah. That's right. You're right, Frankie. I'm revolting. Hmm? <laughs> Frankie, look, can't you see you've given me the spirit? From now on, Phil Harris is through being pushed around by Dane. Bravo. On to the Bastille. Off with their guillotines. <laughs> Yes, sir. Tomorrow morning, come what may, Phil Harris is not going to wear no man's bunny suit. Alice. What, Phil? My tail just fell off. <laughs> Well, stand still. I'll pin it back on. There. Why, with those sewed-up feet and those big floppy ears, you look just like a great big cuddly bunny rabbit. I look like a big jerk, and you know it. <laughs> you do not. Now hop around the room for me and recite the poem I taught you. But, Alice, I've done it three times already. Go on. But, Alice, it's so silly. Phil Harris, start hopping. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> I am the Easter Bunny. Hippity, hippity, hop. My ears are long and funny, flippity, flippity, fly. <laughs> and I'll see that every girl and boy a present never lacks, but if they get too close to me, I'll break their little back. <laughs> Phil, that's not in the poem. I'll say what I want. Me bunnies are organized. <laughs> Hey, what time does the party start anyway? Oh, the kiddies will be here in about an hour. Huh. Oh, my goodness, I just thought of something. What's wrong now? I ordered two live rabbits for the party, and I forgot all about picking them up. Don't be silly. There's no such thing as two rabbits. <laughs> now, look, Phil, you'll just have to drive downtown and get them. But, honey, I won't have time to change before the kids will get here. I know that. You'll have to go as you are. I will not leave this house wearing no pink bunny suit Oh, yes, you will Alice, you're hurting my shoulder <laughs> I'll call the pet shop and tell them you're coming Now get the car out and hurry Oh, hurry, all hurry, right, hurry all up, right hurry. Come on. Gosh, I never knew the French Revolution was so one-sided <laughs> Well, here's the pet store. Wiz, I hope nobody sees me in this rabbit suit. 
No. <laughs> well, I guess that's the owner over there. Hey, fella. Oscar, get back in your cage. <laughs> Wait a minute, I'm not one of your bunnies Then whose bunny are you? <laughs> now you listen to me I never saw such a big rabbit What have you been eating, Wheaties? <laughs> now cut it out I came here to buy some little bunnies Buy them? What's the matter? Can't you have any of your own? <laughs> hey look, Buster What's wrong with you anyway? Well, you've got me all rattled you see, most of my customers are people. <laughs> Look, will you stop that? I am not a rabbit. I am Phil Harris. Well, with those pink eyes, you could have fooled me. <laughs> now, look. My wife ordered two rabbits, and I'm supposed to come and pick them up. Uh, yes, sir. Well, I have them right here in this crate. Well, all right, then. Let me have them. Uh, very well. Now, I guess you got it through your head that I'm not a rabbit. Oh, yes, Mr. Harris. All right, goodbye. Goodbye, Harvey. Gee whiz, I'm always in a jam, and I better step on it. That party's probably begun already. Uh-oh. What's that up ahead? Oh, brother, it's a roadblock. The cops are stopping everybody again. <laughs> oh, murder. I'd take this darn costume off, only I've got nothing under it but my shorts. Oh. This is just a routine checkup, mister. May I see your register? Ah! <laughs> What's up, Doc? <laughs> How are you, officer? A bunny. Well, I knew anybody could get a license in California, but this is ridiculous. <laughs> now, wait a minute, officer. I can explain. I'm Phil Harris. Yeah? Let me smell your breath. <laughs> now, wait a minute, officer. You see, my wife is having a party, and, uh... And I'm a rabbit. Oh, fine. We had one last night that thought he was a dachshund. <laughs> I, uh, I think you and the sergeant better have a little talk. Now, wait a minute, officer. I got to get home. I'm in a It'll hurry. It'll only take a minute, Peter Rabbit. <laughs> hey, look, Buster. How would you like to have a good punch right in the nose? Oh, one of them kind, huh? Get out of that car. Don't shout at me, Wendy. I'll have you transferred to Boyle Heights. Get out of that car! But officer, 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 please, officer, not by my ears. Mommy, the party's half over. Where's Daddy? Yes, we want the Easter Bunny. Well, I don't know what's happened to your father, babies. He should have been back an hour ago. Alice. You don't suppose Phil is there? Oh, no, Mother, not on Easter. <laughs> no. Well, the children are getting awfully impatient, Alice. Why don't you sing something for them? You better do something. It's getting awfully dull around here. All right, Phyllis. When I was born, my ma and pa, they looked at me and said, Oh, yeah. The doctor said it's a girl, I think. And Pa went out and got a drink. Then Ma said, I look just like Pa. And Pa said, I took after Ma. And Jane said, I look like a quince. And I've been a stepchild ever since. Oh, why do they always pick on me? Why do they never let me be? I'm so very lonesome, awfully sad. It's a long time since I've been glad, but I know what I'll do by and by. 
I'll eat some worms and then I'll die. And when I'm gone, you wait and see. They'll all be sorry that they picked on me. Now, why do they always, always have to pick on me? Why do they never, never, never let me be? I'm so very lonesome, awfully sad. It's a long, long time since I've been glad. But I know what I'll do by and by. I'm going to eat me some worms, and then I'll die. And when I'm gone, you wait and see. They'll all be sorry, terribly, terribly sorry. Gee, they're really going to be sorry that they picked. Can we do something for you, ma'am? Yes, I'm Alice Fay. I came down as soon as you called, Sergeant. Oh, yes, Miss Fay. We have him right down the hall here. Just follow me. Hiya, kiddo. What they got you in for? (laughs) Phil. Phil, it's me. What happened to you? I was terribly worried, and the children were so disappointed. Look, you lay off of me. I'm in enough trouble. Well, how did you get in here? All the cops were stopping everybody, and some wise guy picked me up on three charges. Vagrancy, impersonating a bunny, and biting a steering wheel off of a police car. (laughs) Well, for heaven's sakes, when they stopped you, why didn't you take off the bunny suit? I did, and they added three more charges. (laughs) His bail's $25, Miss Faye. Would you like to pay it now? Well, I don't know if he's worth $25. Now, wait a minute, Alice. You've got to pay it. Get me out of here. They say if I wasn't called for in two hours, a veterinarian destroys me. (laughs) Oh, all right, egghead. Well, get me out of here. Alice and Phil will be back in a moment. More people look at your hair than you'd ever guess because they see it from the sides, the back, and from angles you never see. So be sure your hair creates a good impression. Remove unsightly dandruff easily and completely with Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Fitch is guaranteed to remove dandruff the first time you use it. It's the only shampoo made whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance firms. You see... Fitch penetrates and cleanses the thousands of tiny hair openings on the scalp, dissolving all traces of dandruff. Then it forms a rich lather to float it away. And that's all there is to it. Fitch has been granted the good housekeeping seal. So use it regularly for well-groomed, dandruff-free hair that wins approving glances. Buy an economical bottle at drug or toilet goods counters or have professional applications of Fitch's dandruff remover shampoo at barber or beauty shop. Phil, look at the ears on your rabbit suit They're all curly and wavy Sure, I'm no fool I just washed them in fit shampoo NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. Well, hello again. This is Buck Benny speaking. Welcome to another episode of the Jack Benny Show from the 1936-1937 season. It's 2017, and I'm recording a new intro to this episode because I don't think I've ever introed this episode before, nor have I ever presented it before. That's a rarity. Um, here's here's what happened. This is not like a missing episode or anything. But here's what I think happened. When I originally presented this season, it was during like the first year that I was doing my podcast. And I started presenting 36, 37 just as kind of a, 
I think it was doing a best of Benny, essentially. I started from the beginning, 1932, and presented his first episode. And then I presented the episode with the first episode with Mary and the first episode with Don Wilson and so forth. Well, I worked myself through up until 1937, and then I started playing a lot more episodes, and we hit the episodes featuring Eddie Anderson, and I started presenting every episode with Eddie Anderson, or any guest stars. So this episode doesn't have Eddie Anderson, doesn't have guest stars, it just has the normal cast plus Andy, Andy Devine, and so I think I skipped it that first time through. Then, years later, when I was presenting the season yet again, I think I just grabbed the next episode, podcast episode that I introed, and didn't even realize that I'd skipped this one. So I don't think I've ever presented this to you before. So that's pretty cool that I can present this. It's a pretty nice episode. It's just with the normal cast... But I kind of like it when it's just with the normal cast. It gives us a chance to really enjoy them. They, they're each doing fun things. In this episode, Mary's going to be planting some mashed potatoes. And Mary also does one of her communications from her mother. They mention something in here of Waukegan, that's Jack's hometown, where they planted a tree in his honor. Well, this elm tree, soon after this, would die. And after it died... Fred Allen made one of his best jokes about Jack. He said, well, how could that elm tree live in Waukegan when the sap was living in California, of course, referring to Jack? And I, I always loved that joke. Um, and it's just kind of cool to hear how it got started here with this uh, tree that they planted in Waukegan in honor of Jack. That's why they always say don't plant trees in people's honors because a lot of times they don't make it. <laughs> Better to give them a bench or something. Or in Jack's case, Waukegan eventually dedicated a whole element, not elementary school, a middle school to him. And that's pretty cool. And he was really honored by that. Anyway, without further ado, here is a episode that we, I think has never been presented before on my podcast. And I hope you're going to enjoy it. From 1937, April 4th, here we have Jack and the Gang. Enjoy! J-E-L-L-O! -L -L the Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston and Phil Harris and his orchestra. The orchestra opens the program with Boo Hoo! <laughs> of us take a lot of things for granted, like the telephone, the movies, and I know that often goes for your grocer, too. You know he's always there, ready to serve you. But I wonder if you also realize that your grocer is your friend, who is constantly striving to give you the most efficient personal service, plus the finest foods available. We're mighty pleased with the way our dealers have been so anxious to meet your demands for Jell-O, and the way in which they have kept Jell-O prominently displayed, where you can see it and get it quickly and easily. And the makers of Jell-O want me to remind you that April 5th to April 10th is National Retail Grocers Week. And we hope you'll patronize your grocer this week especially to your fullest extent. The next time you're in the store, be sure to get a supply of Jell-O. There are six delicious flavors and every one is made from fresh, ripe fruit. But be sure you get genuine Jell-O, for no other gelatin dessert has Jell-O's extra rich fruit flavor. Ask for Jell-O and look for the big red letters on the box. That was Boo Hoo, played by Phil Harris and his orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen. Spring is here, ah, oh, beautiful spring, bringing with it butterflies, blossoms, wildflowers, April showers, and... Jack Benny. Yes, 
Hello again. This is your little buttercup speaking. <laughs> Isn't that springish, folks? <laughs> ah, but spring is here. Nature beckons, and we are all victims of its magic spell. Aren't we, Don? You said it. Honestly, Don, I feel so good I could go right out and play two brisk holes of golf. <laughs> Don't overdo it. <laughs> Aren't you glad that we're back in California, especially during the spring season? Oh, I sure am, Jack. Everything is so bright and green. And have you noticed how warm it's getting? Yes, sir. Real summer weather. And by the way, Jack, have you filled your swimming pool yet? Yes, Don, with water and relatives. <laughs> But I don't care about that. I have other interests this time of year, planting and gardening. Really, you don't know how much pleasure I get out of working in my garden, just digging into things. Jack, I didn't know you were interested in gardens. Oh, Don, just give me a hoe and a package of seeds and I'll sow my head off. <laughs> I'm just mad about parsley in its wild state. Oh, go on, Jack. You're not the type that works in a garden. I'm not, eh? Look at these calluses on my hands. Those are knuckles. Well, if I turned them over, you'd see something. <laughs> oh, yes, Don, I'm a real gardener. In fact, quite a soil tiller. Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Tilly. <laughs> That's tiller, and you can laugh if you want to, but I've gone in for agriculture in a big way. I'm not laughing, Jack. Gee, I plant a garden every year. You do? I'll say. Just give me a hoe and a package of seeds, and Mary Dora goes wild. <laughs> well, well. I've been working on my garden all week. Oh. Yesterday, I put in carrots, pansies, cherries, violets, and radishes. Mm. And I planted them in straw. In straw? What are you trying to raise? Spring hat. <laughs> Spring hat? That's silly. By the time they come up, the season will be over. Then I can add a turkey and use them for Christmas baskets. Well, that's very clever, very. Say, Mary, the way you grow things, you're a regular Luther Burbank. Mm -hmm. I'll say. I even found out a way to grow mashed potatoes. How? Well, first I put vanishing cream on the skins. Yes. Then I plant them with a hammer. <laughs> oh, go away, Gracie. <laughs> hey, you know, I don't think either of you knows much about gardening as I do. Oh, really? Well, I've had a ranch for years, and I've been very successful with it. Now, what do you raise, Don? Oh, uh, strawberries, uh, raspberries, cherries, oranges. Lemons and limes, I know, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Have you a very big place? No, just six delicious acres. Oh. Well, I must drive out and see it sometime. Uh, look for the big red letters on the mailbox. That's right, Mary. <laughs> hello, Jack. What are you talking about? Uh, hello, Phil. We were just discussing our different hobbies. Uh, do you go in for gardening, Phil? Not me. You don't care for it, huh? No. Give me a hoe and a package of seeds and I'll throw them in your face. <laughs> I know, you'd rather have a pool cue and a package of cigarettes. Yeah. Say, Jack. Yeah? You're getting to be quite a celebrity in your hometown, aren't you? Why, right, what do you mean? Well, I saw a newsreel last night showing the big celebration your hometown put on for you. Oh, is it in the newsreel? Well, that's right, Phil, and I want to tell you it was the greatest thrill of my life. Walt Keegan really went to town. Yeah, quite a tribute, wasn't it? Yes, sir. What a day. I'll never forget it. But the thing that, Phil, really, the thing that touched me most was the tree they planted in my honor right on the public square. And they called it the Jack Benny Elm. <laughs> oh, just imagine, fellas, that little tree in the village green represents me. Isn't that a poetic thought? It certainly is. Hey, can't you just picture it? Birds nesting on my limbs. <laughs> <laughs> No, really, lovers carving their initials in my trunk. Beautiful. <laughs> and can't you just see me there in the park, swaying to and fro in the breeze? Drunk again. <laughs> you know I don't drink. And then picture me there in the various seasons. Winter, and my limbs are covered with snow. Then spring comes, and I bud. <laughs> <laughs> then summer comes, and the soft breezes caress me. Then woodpeckers come in your air condition. Ah, <laughs> uh, there's, there's no use trying to be high class here. Anyway, that tree represents me. <laughs> Rover, get away. I tell you, boys. 
I tell you, when, when your hometown comes through like that... Hello, fellas. Oh, hello, Kenny. What are you talking about? Uh, Jack thinks he's a tree. Oh, boy, let's climb him. Hey, <laughs> don't get smart, Kenny. What a gang on this program. Isn't there a single nature lover among you? I think that I shall never see a thing as lovely as a tree. Did you ever see Marlon Dietrich in a bathing suit? Oh, yes. What am I thinking of? <laughs> Play, Phil. Oh, Woodman, spare that Dietrich. <laughs> Town played by Phil Harris and his orchestra. And I want to tell you, Phil, it's really a pleasure to work with you after that other band leader in New York. You know, the one who thought he had me scared. What a rowdy. Now, wait a minute, Jack. If you're referring to Abe Lyman, I want you to know that he's a friend of mine. Oh, I didn't know he had one. <laughs> and furthermore, Abe is as sweet and gentle as a lamb. Yeah, he's gentle, all right. He slapped me on the back one night and my pants went to half mad. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Jack, you know... <laughs> well. Oh, Abe is just a great big boy, but he's really a nice fella, isn't he, Mary? Yeah, I was out with him four times, and he never hit me once. <laughs> well, you probably ducked. Anyway, I'd punch him right in the nose if I wasn't afraid he'd sue me. Or you're a safe. Is that so? <laughs> the trouble with you, Jack, is, well, you can't get along with anybody. You're always running people down. Oh, I don't know. You never heard me pan anyone but Lyman, did you? What about Fred Allen? Oh, you mean my pal, Freddy? <laughs> Why, we're the best of friends. Our little feud was all in fun, and we were just tossing jokes back and forth. Well, he tossed them further than you did. <laughs> yeah, he was funnier, too. Everybody knows that. Well, that's silly. I got just as many laughs as he did. Yes, but don't you see, Jack, they were laughing with him and at you. Oh, you're imagining things. No, I'm not. Why, Alan made you the laughing stock of the country. He did? Certainly. <laughs> he said you were anemic, didn't he? Oh, but that was just kidding. Oh, Freddie is the sweetest guy in the world. Kidding? You are anemic, aren't you? Well, I, uh... Well, there is a little drought in my blood vessel. <laughs> but, but, gee... Freddie didn't mean anything. He's too regular. Well, you think it was fair of him to point out your physical condition? Well, I, uh, I... Uh... Was that nice? Oh, he didn't mean anything. Well, he that's was... a sporting thing to do. Well, I... Uh... Was it? Well, it, it, it certainly was not. <laughs> Who does Alan think he is? Honey, I didn't see through that guy before. Well, that's because he's tricky. He took advantage of you. Phil, you're right. There he goes again. Thanks, Phil, for exposing that double-crosser. And to think I was up to Alan's house for dinner. Well, I might have been poisoned. How do I look, Mary? Poisoned. 
There you are. I was right. Don, get me a doctor, quick. Now, Jack, Jack, pull yourself together. What's wrong? I've been poisoned by Fred Allen. Why, Jack, that's the silliest thing I ever heard of. Allen wouldn't harm a fly. Oh, he wouldn't, eh? After what I just heard. Calm down now. Allen is the best friend you ever had. Yeah? Certainly. (laughs) You're just letting Phil Harris get you all riled up. You know Phil is a troublemaker. Ain't he the rat? Well, I'm I'm not so sure about that. Oh, Jack, you've got a mind like a seesaw on a merry-go-round. Oh, yeah? Mary is right. What do you listen to Harris for, anyway? He's only out to get your goat. Well... And another thing, Fred Allen loves you like a brother. Hmm. He does? Of course he does. <laughs> well, gee, I... I always thought Freddie and I were pals. I, gee, I don't know why I let... Now, you listen to me, Phil Harris. If you think you can start a lot of trouble around here and sway me, you're badly mistaken. boy, Jack. I'm on to your little game. Believe me, you didn't have me fooled for one second. Well, I have the right to my opinion. Opinion? You got an opinion like a seesaw on a merry-go-round. Did that come around again? And another thing, Harris, keep your nose out of my business if you know what's good for you. That's what I say. You shut up. <laughs> I'll attend to Phil. Oh, lay off, Jack. Phil Harris is the best friend you ever had. He is? (laughs) Gosh, now where am I? (laughs) Oh, let's drop the whole thing and go on with this program before I make a chump out of myself. You mean again? Uh, I never saw such a... What are you going to sing now, Kenny? Gee, I got so excited about you being poisoned, I forgot. Well, I wasn't poisoned. Mary, while Kenny is singing... Send a wire to Fred Allen and tell him I'm sorry, will you? Shall I pay for it? No, let him be a little sorry, too. (laughs) Okay. Well, sing, Kenny. Play troublemaker or pal or whatever you are. Why I ever accepted that watch Bill gave me for Christmas, I don't know. Sung by Kenny Baker. And I want to tell you, Kenny, I feel much better now. That song really soothed my jangled nerves. I'm glad you liked it, Jack. Give me a hoe and a package of seeds, and I can sing like a canary. Oh. Well, I <clears throat> particularly like that number. Uh, something new, isn't it? Yes, for my picture of the same name. Oh, that's right. The, uh, the new one you made for Paramount. Mm-hmm. I was in it, too. Yes, I know. I know. <laughs> well, why didn't you mention it? Now, what am I, a press agent or a comedian? You're a cluck. 
<laughs> it is awfully funny since you started making pictures. I bet you got in on somebody else's screen pad. It wasn't yours. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Do you want your watch back? Yes. Indian giver. <laughs> Try and get it. Oh, I hate to have him. Yeah. Watch back. I hate to have him. I hate to have him in a picture with me. I bet he drove everybody on the set crazy. Especially the girls. Oh, I don't know, Mary. I don't know. Phil's not so much. Take away that wavy hair and those blue eyes and pearly teeth and that physique of his, and, and what have you got? You. The fine answer. I'm sorry we were interrupted, Kenny. What are we talking about? My picture. Oh, yes. And say, you seem to be pretty busy these days. I understand you're singing here at the Paramount Theater this week. Sure, and I tell jokes, too. Smart ones. Oh. <laughs> so you tell smart jokes, huh? I bet the, I bet the audience doesn't get them. Neither do I. <laughs> Well, I can't understand that. Uh, didn't anyone in the audience laugh? Oh, only my girl. But what does she know? <laughs> well, she has faith in you, anyway. You know, Jack, oh. I saw Kenny Zack last night, and believe me, his singing goes over big. Well. He's a regular Jeanette McDonald. <laughs> well, I'm proud of you, Kenny. I really am. You know, I used to love the stage myself. It's, it's too bad Vaudeville is dead. You did your part. <laughs> Phil, if you're trying to get that watch back, it's no use. Anyway, Kenny, I'm glad you're doing so well at the Paramount, and I hope your picture will be just as successful. Uh, what's the name of it again? Turn Off the Moon. Turn Off the Moon. That's a nice title. You know, I'm starting my new picture in about two weeks. It's, uh, it's all about my career on the airwaves. Oh, yeah? What's the name of it? Turn Off the Radio. <laughs> well, don't do it, folks. He's only kidding, right? Anyway, uh, that's not the name of my picture. It's called the... Oh, pardon me. Hello? Yes? Long distance? It's for you, Mary. Plainfield calling. Oh, my mother. Yeah. You must have straightened things out with a phone company. <laughs> hello? Oh, hello, Mama. What a surprise. You look great. Mary, you're talking on the phone. Well, Mama doesn't analyze things. <laughs> I know, I saw Papa. <laughs> Might as well give myself a joke once in a while. Yes? Yes, what's that, Mama? No, no, you're all mixed up. It's nothing like that. What's wrong, Mary? Mama's mad because you poisoned Fred Allen. <laughs> uh, tell her I didn't do it. No, Mama. Does Jack look like a murderer? He does not. <laughs> oh, nobody looks good in the newsreel. Thanks, Mary. Thanks. Uh, say, Mama, did you have a nice Easter? Oh, that's good. How's Papa? What? <laughs> he did. <laughs> what happened, Mary? <laughs> what happened? Papa looked in the mirror yesterday and said, Fair traps all over the house. <laughs> That's fine. Why does he get a haircut? Yes, Mama. I will. Yes, uh huh. Hello, Buck. Just thought I'd drop in and see how you are. Oh, hello, Andy. See, not so loud. Mary's talking on the phone. Huh? Oh, pardon me. <laughs> uh, what, Mama? No, Jack isn't playing his violin. It's Andy Devine. <laughs> Oh, oh, come here, Annie, and say hello to my mother, will you? Sure. Hello, Mrs. Livingston. I said hello, Mrs. Livingston. Hello? Oh, give me that phone. Mama, it's Andy. Hello? Hello, Mama. Hello? Oh, you scared her, Andy. She hung up. <laughs> Doggone it, I'm always scaring people. No, you're all right, Annie. It was just a sudden shock, you know. What brings you here, anyway? Well, Buck, I've been having trouble over at my place all week long. You have? Yeah, you remember that menu you gave me from the... <laughs> from the Waldorf Astoria? Menu? Yeah, the bill affair. That's menu, menu. <laughs> well, whatever it was, I showed it to my chickens. You know the part where it says two eggs, 90 cents? 
Oh, you, you showed it to your chickens, huh? Uh, yeah, and now they want to live in the house. <laughs> well, you're not... You're not gonna... You're not gonna stand for that, are you, Andy? <laughs> no, sirree, I ain't gonna throw my pigs out for no hands. <laughs> Well, I don't blame you. No use discomforting yourself. Uh, say, how's your garden coming along, Andy? Huh? Oh, fine, but I'm having a little trouble with my hired man. He can't see very well. Yeah, well, what happened? Well, yesterday he cut down the picket fence. He thought it was corn. <laughs> well, like, well, Andy, look, why don't you get him a pair of glasses? I can't, Buck. If he ever sees them pigs in his room, he'll quit. <laughs> well, now, that's silly. I mean, it doesn't... Look, Andy, so silly. Doesn't he ever step on them? Yeah, but he thinks they're calluses. <laughs> well, I can't, I can't understand that. Don't the pigs groan and squeal? Sure, but they sound just like me, and he don't pay any attention to them. <laughs> well, then you're very lucky. You're very lucky. Say, uh, come here a minute, Andy. I, I want to ask you something about my garden. Look, do you think that if I... Uh, wait a minute, Andy. Play, Phil. Andy... Do you think that my artichokes would object if I put onions next to them? Well, I don't know. I don't know. What do you think about it, Andy? I think... Well, Andy, what do you think about it? Well, Andy, what do That was Riding High from Red Hot and Blue, played by Phil Harris and his asparagus. I mean, his orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to make a serious announcement regarding one of our future programs. We have received hundreds and hundreds of requests to repeat some of the more popular plays which we presented during 1936. Now, as we do not know which one of these plays to select, we are going to ask you to make your own choice from a list I am about to give you. Now, take a pencil and a piece of paper, and here is the list. Are you ready? Now, here we go. A mutiny on the Jello. Hold on here. Hold on a minute. Oh, pardon me, folks. There's a lady in Racine, Wisconsin, who's not quite ready. <laughs> um, are you all set now? Okay. Let her rip. Well, here we go. <laughs> here we go. Now, remember, mutiny on the Jello. Code of the Hills. Way down east. Our wilderness. Charlie Chan in Radio City, Emperor Jones, and Why Girls Leave Home. I know. Quiet. <laughs> now, be sure and write in your choice, addressing me care of NBC Studio, Hollywood, California. And the play receiving the largest number of votes will be presented on this program in about four weeks. Results to be announced later. Well, I guess that just about washes up the program for tonight. <laughs> Hey, Kenny, what are you writing there? A vote for Turn Off the Moon. I have a swell part in that. Oh. <laughs> are you voting, Don? Why, sure. And, Jack, uh, which play was it where I said, uh, 
Jell-O is the most popular gelatin dessert in the world with its new extra-rich fresh fruit flavor and every day millions of people eat it. Well, just take any one of them, Don. Any one of them will do it. Huh? Well, you can all go now, fellas. Okay. Well, so long, Jack. See you next Sunday. So long, Kenny. Take it easy, Jack. Say, Jack. Yes, Bill. I wasn't in any of those plays you mentioned. Well, we'll find a little part for you. That's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> Don't worry. Wait for me, Mary. I'll take you home. All right, Jack. Well, so long, Buck. Oh, are you still here, Andy? Yeah, but I'm going, too. Say, wait a minute, Andy. Before you go, uh, come here a minute. Look at this, will you? What? Well, here's a funny seed I found this morning. I, I can't make out what it is. Let's see it. Mm, looks like a watermelon seed. Well, I don't know, Andy. It, you know, it, it looks more like a sunflower seed. I can't figure it out. Let me see that, Jack. Here. Oh, what's the matter with you guys? This is an elk's tooth. Hmm, it sure is. <laughs> yep, it's an elk's tooth, all right. Throw it away, Jack. No use raising elk. No, that's right. That's right. Come on, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> There's a brand new Jell-O dessert that you're going to say right off the reel is something really special. Banana Bavarian cream. Smooth, rich, and downright delicious. And here's all you do to make it. Dissolve one package of lemon Jell-O in one pint of hot water. Then whip one half a cup of heavy cream and fold it into the Jell-O when the Jell-O is slightly thickened. Next, fold in five bananas, crushed to a pulp, and sweeten. Mold and serve, and listen to the family cheer. For everybody is sure to enjoy the combination of the rich banana flavor with the tart, tangy lemon jello. So serve it soon. But when you make your banana Bavarian cream, be sure to make it with genuine jello. For only jello has that extra rich fruit flavor, flavor from fresh, ripe fruit. That's why jello is the most popular gelatin dessert in the world today. So always be sure to get the real thing genuine jello. the last number of the 27th program in the new Jell-O series, and we'll be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. Good night, folks. J-E-L-L-O! The Jell-O program comes to you from Hollywood over the Red Network.